Hey, I'm Jeff Baumgartner with Light Reading, and we're here at Tech Expo 2024 in Atlanta, and I'm joined by Todd McCrum with Light Opto Electronics Inc. Thank you. A -O -I. Light Opto Electronics Inc. I gotta remember. Yeah, I. You gotta remember the I. So that's okay. A O I. It's a lot easier. Yeah. So here at the show, for years really, we've been talking about cable operators getting interested in. 1.8 gigahertz technology, you know, with 4. Doxus 4.0 out on the horizon. Uh, but it feels like we're now in a mode of realism with 1.8 gigahertz technology, and I know that's a focus for AOI here at the show. So maybe start there. What uh, what do you have going on the 1.8 side? Yeah. So um, you know, we're showing a full suite of nodes and amplifiers. So uh, we, uh, we announced the 1.8 gigahertz uh, node that, go, that uh, goes uh, into the GS7000. We have launched and are shipping the Game Maker style amplifiers, the old uh, Game Maker style. So we've got the high gain dual, uh, the LE high gain balance triple and a boost ramp. Um, launched the transponder that goes in those for telemetry. We'll talk about that, I think. Yep. And then uh, we are uh, in the process of launching the uh, Motorola style, the VLE and the Mini Bridger at 1.8. So, full suite of stuff. Yeah, so what is it? Talk a little bit about the advantages of uh, being able to work with some of that, you know, kind of slot into some of that legacy technology, right? I mean, yeah. Is it just so they don't have to uh, kind of recreate the wheel, you know, when, when they go out there to do 1.8? Absolutely. So, you know, this has been, this has been the story since you know, 94 when I started, right? If you can save the housing that's got all the cabling and power going into it, it's massively less expensive for them to do an upgrade. So if they can just drop in the amplifier, uh, plug in new power, new lid, and go, um, they can do that in minutes as opposed to having to resplice, which could take, for a really experienced tech, probably 20, 25 minutes. Okay. For someone less experienced, it could take an hour, two hours. So okay, so a huge difference. Huge, yeah. huge difference on being able to just drop the technology into the base housing footprint. Okay. And what is the uh, temperature right now for operators for 1.8 gigahertz? Is it really for those that are looking at 4.0 or they're looking to future-proof for a move to 4.0 like in, down the line? You know, who's it appealing to right now? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's a couple things going on. Um, I think the biggest impetus for doing the upgrade is mostly the upstream, right? Okay. So you've got a lot of amplifiers, a lot of pro a lot of HFC plant that's still at 40 megahertz, right? So you know some folks have moved to 85. Um, that's a lot more than a two to one increase, right? Like that usable spectrum is four or five to one uh, bandwidth increase in the upstream. Um, and then you've got other folks that are going all the way up to high split at 200 megahertz. So, uh, you know, you get to that point and now they're gonna move the spectrum, the forward spectrum up. They wanna get to at least 1.2. Um, but as we start to get to 3.1 enhance and 4.1 and you can do, you know, five, five channel bonding, that extra bandwidth is gonna be important for them. So, I mean, the whole impetus for moving is certainly the upstream, but you need to increase your your downstream as well to to uh, move the channel as you move the channels up. Yeah, so in that instance then like Doxus 4.0 is not a necessary thing for them to do to want 1.8. There's, there's other reasons that they would want to Well, even the three do in yeah. some of the 3.1 plus, 3.1 enhanced, right? Where they're gonna be able to do some of the some of the enhanced bonding they'll need that spectrum for that as well. So they'll okay. utilize it there. Uh, certainly when we move to 4.0, they'll want to leverage the spectrum. Okay, and where, uh, I know every operator is a little bit different, but if you had to put it all together and, and try to get a feel for what the market's doing with 1.8, where are they? Are they uh, RFI, RFP, deployments, tests? You know, I mean, if you had to put it all together, where are we on that path? I would say if you look at the the major operators in North America. Right? And so Charter's been very public, uh, Cox has been public, uh, Rogers has been you know, talking a lot about what they're doing. Uh, they're beyond RFI. Um, they're okay. actually doing somewhere between doing massive lab testing and field testing, right? So 
they're definitely looking at doing pretty deep field trials uh, at those operators um, and uh, learning a lot, right? Not just about where the vendor readiness is, but their readiness. So uh, I think the real answer to your question is they are on the cusp of wanting to start doing some deployments. Um, some operators going faster than others in 2025. Okay. I, you know, okay. Just recently, I think you wrote an article and you know, Charter has said they're moving into that second phase. Right. They're gonna be moving really fast in 2025. Okay, all right, that's a great example. And then the other thing we wanted to talk about here was another trend in the amplifier world and that is this shift to smart amplifiers, right? And putting transponders in there. Uh, talk a little bit about the reasoning behind going with a smart amp. If I'm a cable operator, what am I getting for yeah. that? So, um, you know, the smart amp technology is actually incredible, right? So, uh, you know, historically, we would put an amplifier in the field and you'd have technicians setting up uh, attenuation and equalization by plugging in multiple pads and multiple equalizers and trying to manage input, output, you know, tilt, slope, etc. cetera. Um, what the smart amps do is they do all of that through an algorithm that auto balances the amp, right? So, you know, you have a PDA and you say what your input level, your output level is, and, um, you know, essentially the amp goes ahead and, and automatically optimizes the equalization attenuation for the ultimate performance of that amplifier. As you put it into the field, it's also managing cable length and you know cat, number of cascades. So it's a pretty sophisticated amplifier that's uh, looking at the entire plant and doing the auto alignment. So that in and of itself requires you to have processing and firmware in each of the amps. Which is and like new to the amp, isn't it? It's totally new, right? Yeah. It, was, it was an absolutely you know, layer one, just dumb amp, right? I'll say, I, so I won't say dumb, but I mean, it was not, we didn't have not a smart a highly amp, educated so I would say amp. it is a dumb amp, <laughs> as opposed to our smart amps. Yeah. And, um, you know, so as you make the amp smarter and you have the ability to have processors and, and intelligence in it, there's firmware in it. And mm -hmm. uh, I think the thing that, you know, we realized very early on in the game is, anytime you're gonna put millions of devices out that have firmware, not having the ability to do remote firmware upgrades is a real liability, right? We've never, we've never put, you'd never put a set-top out without being able to do a, a bulk download of new firmware. You'd never do that on a set-top, a cable modem. You'd never do that with an RPD and certainly shouldn't do it with, a, with a, a smart amplifier. So we realized that you need to be able to do that. In order to have that, you need some way of two-way two communication. Uh, cost was a big thing we need to think about, right? And so uh, we came up with a protocol and, um, you know, using LoRaWAN and FSK modulation and, um, uh, you know, took it to Cable Labs. Um, and, you know, several of us got together and said, we're gonna build a standard around this. And so uh, I think the, the entire industry realized this is gonna be critical for a couple reasons. First and foremost, the security of having the ability to do remote firmware upgrades. The second thing is being able to do remote troubleshooting, right? Like think of the th think of a lot of the things you can do um, beyond remote firmware upgrades, which is we consider table stakes. The next thing is you can do remote troubleshooting. So you start to get all of this telemetry data coming up from the amp. As amps fail, you build a database of what were the predictors, and you can use AI to say when we start seeing these, let somebody out go out, let's get somebody out to do pre preventative maintenance, and now you can stop this from happening before it ever becomes customer impacting. And then beyond that, once you have that two-way communication, there's so much more you can do, you know. It has a geolocation, so we can do digital mapping that's real-time with every single active out there. We can do remote asset tagging. We know anytime somebody changes a power supply, a module, anything in that, instead of having to physically do that asset tagging, it does it digitally. So there's a host of use cases that are critical to the MSO above and beyond the security of firmware upgrades and troubleshooting. 
All right, well then going forward then, is every amplifier you're putting out going to be smart or are there still going to be instances where maybe the operator doesn't need that? Yeah, so what I would say is that's a debate that we're having across different vendors and MSOs, right? I think what our position is, um, if you want to put out a smart amp, I think you should have a transponder in it, okay? You should be able to make sure you're doing remote firmware upgrades. Well, if you're going to have a transponder in it, the way the transponder should be able to have a virtualized controller. If you want to have a virtualized controller, the way that it, the, the network works is they have to be committed to doing RPD. Right? If they're going to do analog optics, very much more complex to do transponder controller. It's no longer a virtual controller, it has to be physical. So I think where we've drawn the line is to say, you know, look, if you want to do a network where you're going to be going to DAA and you want to do RPDs, then you should very seriously think about using smart amps and transponders. If you are going to be continuing to use legacy analog optics, um, and uh, you should look at doing 1.2 and use more legacy non, you know, legacy equipment. So. Uh, it's it's a little more complex on who's going to do what with that, right? But right. I, I think that that's that's the simple decision point on when you talk about 1.8 smart amps and when you talk about you know using legacy gear. Um, so, okay. but we are adamant that you know we are highly encouraging if you're going to go to smart amp technology, uh, we are strongly encouraging people to use transponders. Okay. Well, interesting, a lot happening in the amplifier world, maybe the most we've ever seen happen in the amplifier world, at least as far as long as I've covered the industry. So Todd, thanks a lot for walking us through. Let's go down 1.8 in the smart amps and uh, we'll see where it goes from here. Appreciate it, thanks right. a lot. Thanks Todd.